assigned by the organizers to sort of coordinate a debate on, uh, let's say, achievements and prospects of applied uh, holography. Um, well, probably the, the subject will not reach as heated a debate as yesterday. Uh, moreover, uh, we do think that uh, discussing achievements is probably a certain degree a waste of time because we more or less know them and also we have a tendency to, uh, uh, to, to overestimate them. So I think by using at least some of the things that we consider as achievements as a benchmark, the interesting probably part for the debate would be to say what we didn't achieve but we should have or at least we would like to and what might be interesting to uh, look for in the future so what we will do, we'll have uh, three of us make a few uh, uh, statements about what they believe and I think we can then uh, try to debate uh, on this particular issue. So I think Hong Liu will probably tell us a few words in a minute. Okay, so, so next, first, uh, um, yeah, let me try to make So, um, yeah, so uh, you have read since the stream people start, started uh, con trying to conquer the world, many, um, many new results was discovered, uh, motivated by uh, trying to uh, find real life applications. And uh, so even though the holographic systems typically are very far from the real life systems, but starting from this, starting from this E of S, uh, we often found that the holographic systems actually exhibit very similar behavior with real life systems. And uh, in the case of the uh, uh, ADS uh, QCD or ADS Quagmon Plasma, this is often enough just to convince people, at least convince ourselves, that uh, maybe for super Young Bill theory at the finite temperature is not that far from QCD. And then we can just proceed to make predictions for QCD just based on any possible Young Mills theory. And, uh, and many people have tried to do this, and many predictions were done, many calculations were performed, and many interesting facts were discovered. And, uh, and some of these predictions are actually being tested at WIC or AFC. Although, so far, uh, at least as far as uh, uh, I myself know, and there have been no, say, definite confirmation of, of, uh, of any of the predictions, so we cannot claim success yet. But those predictions have significantly expanded the, uh, our horizon in terms of as a theorist, but also have provided very uh, important guidance to experimentalists, because the, uh, we, uh, sometimes the observable was uh, 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 proposed, and also uh, sometimes new angle was uh, uh, pointed out, etc. So in this sense, uh, ADSQDQ or ADSQCD can be considered as highly successful, say, as a scientific enterprise, uh, because the, uh, actually as predictions and experimentalists, actually they're responding to the predictions. But the story for, for uh, uh, if we, but we might try to repeat the story for ADSMT, the story is actually, uh, 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 is, yeah, the life is actually much harder. Again, here, uh, one discovered many interesting effects, say, related to finite density systems, which are typically related, yeah, uh, uh, for kinesmatic application, very interesting finite density systems. And again, similarities in, uh, in uh, uh, this real life system were found, which are uh, uh, definitely encouraging and exciting. But here, we have a much deep, more difficult case to argue. So we have to really convince ourselves or convince the matter community <coughs> that the lessons or features which we learned from those gravity series, uh, uh, from, from those series can be described by gravity, like I was for young male series, ABGM, etc. They are really relevant, say, for the real life electron, real life electron systems, which is far from uh, uh, clear uh, as 
certainly at first sight. Uh, in, in this sense, the relation between QCD and M for super young male series is much closer. So, so at this level, just to have similarities, even though it's exciting at the beginning, but uh, just have similarities is not enough, actually, not to often make predictions. So, so, so if you want to make uh, predictions for condensed matter systems, typically you have to point out pre precisely for what kind of condensed matter systems, uh, for what kind of effect will happen. And uh, 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 this is certainly more difficult uh, um, than the quadrant plasma case. In the quadrant plasma case, there's only one quadrant plasma. And not to mention, uh, uh, just based on those similarities, there's no way we can actually uh, uh, solve the real life. Uh, it's just much, yeah, uh, we can also not solve the real life problem just based on those similarities. So, so for this reason, uh, at least my person to believe that after the, the initial excitement, say about the many similarities between the holographic systems and the experimental systems, to, to actually to deliver something real, to deliver some real physics is actually uh, 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 not easy and to remain relevant is not easy. So, so here actually there's also no shortcut. So uh, uh, really, uh, uh, after uh, learning the, those uh, uh, fascinating uh, effects from the holograph systems, we, now we do have to study real this matter systems, talk about experimental physics. And then uh, in, in, some, in some sense, uh, to become a real this matter physicist. Uh, uh, as far as I can see, that's the only way uh, we can actually uh, uh, bring the holography uh, to the real this matter. And uh, so, so a lot of aspects is that other than, say, simulating specific condensed matter systems, which are certainly important, and, uh, but it's also uh, uh, generally difficult because, the, um, yeah, because we, we only have now a Billy Gates theory to play with. And, uh, but it, uh, but it, it is perhaps easier and uh, maybe potentially uh, more rewarding, we actually uh, uh, try to, uh, yeah, this is, uh, in some essentially empty word everybody knows, is that uh, maybe it's more rewarding that we actually try to extract the general, some kind of general effect, the general dynamical magnitude or theoretical structure from gravity. So let me just give you an example. Say, had spin theory or, or ADSFT been discovered in the 60s rather than 90s, then uh, 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 we might have discovered uh, confinement first before the, before the real life uh, um, uh, deep in our yeah, uh, uh, before the real QCD was discovered. And uh, so this is one such example which holography already uh, uh, offered us. It's just the confinement, even though it's something very non-trivial from field theory point of view, from the gravity side, is something rather mundane, and uh, it's almost everywhere. And uh, so, so conceivably, there might be many other such kind of structures uh, to be discovered. So let me just mention two aspects, quickly mention two aspects, which I think maybe uh, 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 we have a chance maybe to really learn some theoretical structure uh, from, uh, uh, from gravity. Of course, there are, there are many uh, uh, such possible uh, uh, opportunities. Uh, I'm just mentioning two here, just as an example. The one is about system without quasi particles. How to deal with system without quasi particles is really uh, um, essentially the most challenging problem right now in, in modern this matter theory. So if you look at the, uh, the difficult problems in condensed matter physics today, say non fermi liquids, uh, quantum phase transition, spin liquids, etc., essentially all of them have to do with systems without quasi particles. And uh, this is something which, uh, uh, in the gauge of gravity, which we can do with very uh, with great ease. Say say just ADSFT, uh, the system described by the gravity they typically don't have quasi particles, but we can treat them easily using gravity. But, uh, but of course, the, we know that the, the systems which gravity can treat are rather limited. And, uh, but also, on the other hand, it's uh, how, how really the gravity can treat the system without the further particle are rather mysterious. But essentially just presented with the answer. Uh, we just uh, uh, work with the metric, etc. But it would be much nicer if we can try to uh, uh, extract from, the, from gauge gravity, say, some kind of systematic theoretical method for treating the system without quasi particles. So this SWOQ uh, denotes for a uh, uh, system without quasi particles. And just like the, uh, 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 more than 100 years ago, Boltzmann invented his uh, kinetic theory for treating the system with quasi particles. 
So, so we should remember in the case when, uh, when Boltzmann uh, uh, invented his kinetic theory, he actually has to assume the existence of atoms and molecules. At that time, the, the existence of molecules and the atoms was not established. So, so maybe, maybe here we need some brand new concepts. And maybe uh, uh, this concept is hidden in the gravity. So this is one issue. And another, uh, 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 I believe, important question is that the uh, uh, holography may have the opportunity to teach us major things about radiation group. Now, so current formulation of the, uh, say, Wilsonian RG, essentially uh, uh, based on two different approaches. One is uh, 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 that particle people or stream people are familiar with is the just evolution of Euclid effective action uh, as, a, as a function of scale. And uh, so this is typically applied, uh, so this is typically convenient for the computing scattering amplitude and no energies, et cetera, and near the vacuum, et cetera. But for condensed matter people, uh, 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 this Euclidean uh, approach is not that useful. Uh, a, a much a more powerful approach for, for condensed matter problem is typically based on the Hamiltonian approach. People uh, you have in condensed matter, they consider, uh, say, evolution of the wave function on the, on the energy scale, and, uh, and that can help them ask, uh, uh, answer many other questions which uh, effective action cannot answer. For example, entanglement entropy, et cetera. And also this uh, kind of uh, a wave function, uh, this wave function approach is also both suitable for, for lattice and numerics, et cetera. So, so, so RG is really the most essential tool we have or the most essential uh, uh, guiding principle we have for dealing with many body systems. But neither approach, when you try to apply the strongly coupled systems, uh, uh, they're not really perfect. Uh, uh, so this is Euclidean effective action, uh, it's actually very hard to, to be applied to, to strongly coupled systems. And this, uh, uh, this Hamiltonian approach can in principle be, be applied, but still the, develop, the current development is very limited. But there are many strong indications that actually the radial involution in ADS suggests some kind of radiation group which incorporates both. And uh, so we know that in the ADS the, uh, 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 the geometry goes one into the state. And so each geometry goes one into a state. But the evolution of the geometry along the radial direction uh, also goes one into the RG. So in some sense the geometry actually describes the evolution of the wave function from the field theory. So, 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 but also we know that the ADS, the radio evolution, does in, in, in incorporate effective action. So, so it seems like the ADS may actually tell us a very powerful, uh, 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 may imply a very powerful uh, organization group approach, which actually can uh, combine uh, 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 these two aspects together. And, uh, and likely, if we have such a formalism for RG, uh, uh, then we also may provide an uh, important tool say, for treating the system.
Now, uh, I lack a better idea for what to say, and when you don't have a good idea about what to do with a class of objects, uh, you do what they do in botany, you just classify. So I think probably the most obvious thing to do right now uh, is to find the analog of the Kerr-Newman classification, uh, not for you know, flat-space black holes, but for these planar black holes in ADS that have somehow been much more central in all these developments. Now, I, I talked about some kind of weak ideas for doing that, but I think stronger ideas of this general flavor have already been pursued for the last four or five years. Uh, the fluid gravity correspondence is in some sense a way to parameterize and think of general wide-ranging on the trees. Uh, black folds, I think, are a, a very similar. Uh, at least in spirit philosophy, is thinking about and parameterizing these geometries. And I think probably a very sharply defined question that hasn't really been answered by these approaches yet, but that might be tractable, uh, is to just find the most general extremal brain. The most general extremal brain is, by the general philosophy of duality, dual to the most general low temperature state in a field theory that's a finite density which, as Long said, is the basic system of interest in condensed matter. So without having any application in mind, this is almost a well-defined math question, not quite well-defined because you have to choose a matter content. Uh, and I think trying to extend these more general ideas like fluid gravity to charge systems at zero temperature is a very interesting pursuit. People have tried to work on it. They encountered various difficulties. They found singular solutions. Uh, I don't have a concrete idea now to propose to you for how to get past that but I'm confident we will. Uh, I think the possible payoffs of such an understanding, I mean, it's hard to know what the payoffs would be without achieving it. Um, one would be, in the early days of fluid gravity, what I thought was very exciting about it was that it, it's geometrizing a d-dimensional field theory flow, quite possibly a complicated and singular flow, in terms of a higher dimensional geometry. And one of the things that happens when you go to higher dimensions is that singular configurations can become non-singular as configurations in total space. Now, the current perturbative constructions in fluid gravity never have that feature. They don't, they don't allow that to happen. But you might actually think that as we understand things beyond the linear regime, there could be <coughs> singularization of singular flows from the point of view of fluids um, by using the nature of the extra-dimensional metric. So the configurations that look singular uh, in conventional field theory may be smoothed out by the gravity. And then the, the next most obvious thing to say, and I think that this lines up very well with what we've seen in ADS-CMT, uh, is that we might well predict new phases of matter as we go and classify these black holes. In fact, you know, I kind of have the opposite perspective on what ADS-CMT has taught us, although there are promising correspondences. If you're really honest about what we find when we study ADS-CMT, we find phases that most condensed matter to the system look sick or peculiar or unstable. They have uh, transport properties that haven't been seen before. There are compressible phases that don't remind them of normal Fermi surfaces. And I think this is actually a feature. Okay? These, these are materials that, that they haven't seen yet. But if they're really typical in gravity, it could be that some of these will actually show up later in, in real physics as new phases. And, and we should not miss the opportunity to do sort of what Hong said and, and find something like confinement before it's seen in nature. OK, the second thing I want to talk about, which is, I think, even more interesting and, and uh, hard to approach concretely, is the role of holography in, in understanding the emergence of space-time. Okay, so there's an attractive idea that's been widely discussed recently, uh, probably it was widely discussed also yesterday, which is the idea that space-time may arise from entanglement. Okay, uh, concretely, well, as concretely as, as we can talk about this now, there are some nice pictures, for instance, from Mark Van Ramstone, where the idea is that if you have a holographic system uh, with some regions A and B, there may be a sense that, that uh, when the dual field theory bits of Hilbert space dual to A and B are, are entangled. There's a macroscopic geometry connecting A and B. And as you reduce the entanglement, maybe that geometry pinches off. And uh, the, the toy system where people try to argue that this is exhibited is, is just the, the system that arises in the study of the thermal field the whole uh, eternal black hole geometry, where the entangled state is represented by the sort of two-sided thing. But there's all, there are also other limits of states, which are, for instance, 2D coupled CFTs corresponding to a product geometry. So I think that's a very interesting direction to try and make more concrete. Uh, at least some of my colleagues at Stanford think that this notion of entanglement generating space may also be related to the firewalls. Uh, but I guess I'm too late to talk about firewalls today. <laughs> now, I think there's another place where there's room for some kind of deep emergence of space time where we haven't yet had extensive discussions of this. And this is coming from the condensed matter literature. 
uh, where uh, Ludwig et al. At, at UCSB and also at Cafe at Caltech um, have, have found a beautiful classification of states of matter. Um, they've, they've, stat that they've, um, they've classified the different phases of, of, of gap systems, of uh, topological insulators, they call them. And this classification basically corresponds to the following. If you ask, given a gap Hamiltonian, what are the space of deformation classes of that Hamiltonian without closing the gap for systems of free fermions? You end up with this nice uh, tenfold way classification. Now, a gap, uh, a gap system is in some sense nothing. There's nothing there on the energy. So what they've really done here is classify the different kinds of nothing states in condensed matter systems. The essential insight there, you might think classifying nothing isn't very interesting, uh, but their essential insight is that the way you get something interesting is when you put two different kinds of nothing next to each other. Because since they're in different classes, they can't be deformed into one another without closing the gap. In between them, when you put them next to each other, you get gapless modes. Okay, and so the something arises at the boundary between two different phases of nothing. Now, they get a K-theory classification. That table I, I was displaying uh, canonically lines up with the different K-theory classes. Uh, and that feels very similar to something that we saw years ago in the classification of D-brains. And maybe even more immediately, it feels similar this, this whole phenomenon of finding something as the, as the boundary of, of nothing kind of feels like the way E8 emerges from M theory, where you take M theory with a boring ball, just maximal supergravity, but you stick in a wall, and what happens is E8 degrees of freedom manifest themselves. Okay? So in the analogy with M theory, macroscopic gravity is one of the nothing phases. It's a pretty interesting nothing phase. And my question would be, what are the other such phases? And is there more depth to this kind of analogy, uh, or is it just an accident? So that's all I had to say. Matching to 
experiments and previous conventional uh, theories. Um, but there's more, there's, there's a lot more. So the thing that's really sort of made me realize that this is um, something which, uh, which we, we really need to attack a lot more um, is some work I did with Gary and George um, over this summer. Um, George was the real superstar here. Um, so this involved seven coupled nonlinear partial differential equations to get the background, followed by either 11 or 12 coupled linear partial differential equations to get the graphs that are shown here. Um, he was a complete hero, but you know, something that's doable, something that's doable on a computer that fits into a um, so, so what did we find? Well, firstly, what did we do? We, we just constructed holographic lattices. So we just took some ADS CFT and put boundary conditions that, that wobbled backwards and forwards. Solved numerically the bulk, so you've now got some bulk geometry which has this ripple running through the bulk geometry. And then we did the simplest thing, we just passed the current uh, through the bulk geometry to see what happens to the current in the presence of a lattice. And what we found was, was at least to us, completely astonishing. We found that um, for a reason that we still don't understand, in some regime of parameter space, the current goes as a power law. The power law is 1 over omega to the 2 thirds. Um, it's more than that. You get exactly the same conductivity um, depending, so you get exactly the same conductivity independent of the temperature. So you see the, these curves on the left here are plotted with three different temperatures. They all sit on top of each other. Um, the real thing I want to take you away from that is there's some new physics going on. There's some new scaling regime implemented by the lattice, induced by the lattice, and we, we don't know why it's there. Um, the second thing I want you to take away from this is this uh, two-thirds is exactly the same as what's seen in the experiment. This is the experimental data um, from business-based cuprates on the right-hand side. You see the same uh, phenomenon of all the different temperatures just collapsing onto a single line. You know, it's very striking. We probably should have plotted this with a slightly longer axis so that even the angle looked the same, but it's exactly the same as the, as the experiment. There's something going on clearly deserves uh, some explanation. Um, however, I think the big question that needs to be attacked, just nobody's looked at it at all, and it's just disorder. Um, as far as I can understand, uh, in the condensed matter community, the bar to understand disorder is extremely low. Basically, it's free physics and not a whole lot else uh, in the presence of disorder. So we, we clearly just have a tool here where you solve holographic backgrounds with random boundary conditions, solve three-dimensional PDs now rather than two-dimensional PDs, there's a whole slew of questions just, just waiting to be answered, and I think opening up whole new areas of research. Um, so if anyone has these kind of skills, um, you'll need it. Contact me. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay, uh, let me have a couple of things and then we can discuss Central point, of course, things that had some contact with the experiments. Okay, the ions we talked about uh, transport, uh, the connection to hydrodynamics has been mentioned. I think this is uh, a central issue that has been debated already, and it opens up very uh, interesting possibilities. Uh, I think the key question here is to what extent hydrodynamics can learn from holography of gravity, or gravity can learn from hydrodynamics. Hydrodynamics is a field that has been studied for 200 years, and lots of results. Many contexts where the physics is difficult, like, uh, as it was mentioned, um, turbulence. My gut feeling is that probably we will learn from hydrodynamics, but I think it would be interesting to see if there are ideas about how the two things uh, can interact. Um, energy losses, in fact, in strongly interacting plasmas have been also something that has been um, uh, important, at least uh, in trying to understand what happens with experimental probes in the heavy ions, and have had some partial success, at least perceptual one. Uh, thermalization is an issue that has been mentioned here, and uh, which I think is something that compared to what people have been doing until now in uh, heavy ions uh, 
has given a 100% contribution. It's something, of course, we don't understand very well in our context, but there is absolutely no understanding outside our context in at least the case of heavy ions. And I think this is a direction where lots of results are appearing now, and in fact, there may be more in the future, at least from the um, point of view of uh, holography. The issue of fluctuations and general rapid time evolution, of course, it was mentioned, and I think this is a case where um, ADS-CFT, in fact, is much better in solving, in fact, problems of that type rather than other approaches. In fact, it's uh, well understood that if you want to start quenching even in triple theory, it has been done only three or four years ago. It's a very difficult problem. So I think I should stop here and try to invite comments, complaints, or uh, anything else. Well, I, again, I agree with everything everybody said, but just to make it a little more controversial, I was slightly surprised that nobody mentioned that to make some more progress, if in particular, as far as condensed matter systems are concerned, definitely we need somehow to understand ADS-CFT beyond the large end limit. And I know it's you know, kind of difficult to do, but is it so difficult we should stop thinking about it? Or I mean, is that not something which is on the list for the next you know, the 10 years or so? Why didn't you say anything about this? <laughs> <laughs> it strikes me as being more difficult than just solving a hover model, so you may as well solve the hover model. Yeah, my own feeling is that the, once you go to um, 1 over n square fractions, uh, physics typically um, allows you to do so. And it then becomes system specific. And once, this, uh, once the result becomes system specific, then there's no reason we want to study the holographic model. Because they are, you only see the general trend. I think uh, uh, C1 over N square is important, but maybe only see the general trend. But to get to the precise information, actually, it's hard. It's just because you, it's very hard to tell whether that's system specific or something universal. But we know, at least for many, uh, given for many supergravity spin theory, one of the corrections, even from spin theory point of view, they are not universal. And uh, so, so it's very hard to, to make a statement, say, about electrons. If even a moment for super young theory or some quiver theory, they are not the same. Uh, we can only make statements about things which are the same, say for instance for super young theory, for ABJM, for, for some quiver theory, and then we say, ah, oh, likely this applies to some electron systems. So if they are already different, even for instance for super young theory and some quiver theory, and then it's a much harder case to sell, say this would apply to something on this. Indeed, I agree with what Colin is saying. However, there may be at least a qualitative question which is in the line of what uh, Giovanna is asking and may have a little bit more, let's say, a universal answer. And I think the important question in that direction is that once you try from an n equal infinity system to figure out properties of a finite kind system, the first thing we worry about is whether there are phase transitions, in fact, that separate the n equal infinity behavior from the finite n behavior. These things, of course, are known in large n systems that have been studied more in details, mostly matrix models of lower dimensional large n theories. And I think if, if one can manage to have some, at least, guidelines or rules about when we expect such finite uh, n transitions, it might be very useful, in fact, in terms of the uh, usefulness Oh, yes, sure. Let me just clarify one point. Uh, uh, I think I uh, said a little bit too, too uh, maybe uh, uh, strongly. Yeah, I think the uh, in, uh, I think for certain questions, one over n square questions can be crucial. And uh, but those questions are rare. But there exist such kind of questions. Sometimes one over n square or one over n questions just become uh, uh, clear. So one example is this eta over s. So eta over s is the same in the leading gravity. But then at the 1 over n square level, then there's a difference. And then in that case, 1 over n square can say something very qualitative, uh, or, uh, 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 something very qualitative about the uh, uh, physics. And uh, yeah, so, so in that case, 1 over n square is indeed important. And in particular, for example, in the example people have discovered, is that if you look at the uh, uh, examples which this 1 over n square, uh, 1 over n correction, have made eta over s smaller than one over four pi. They all come from this 
kind of flavor, uh, a, life, uh, a flavor dynamics. So there's a sense somehow if you include the quarks, fundamental quarks, that will bring down the eta over x. And, uh, and so that's one very crucial insight which people learn from one of the interactions. Yeah, uh, uh, so I think earlier I said a little bit too. too. Yeah, uh, I think it depends on the question. Just in response to, to what Johanna said and also to some of the, the later comments, I think one, one good example of, of the kind of thing Elias was talking about is I think in a lot of the holographic condensed matter systems, there's a clear lack of commutativity between taking frequency to zero when you're studying properties of the geometry and taking n to infinity. And so the low frequency behavior may be completely different at, at finite n than it is at n goes to infinity. And uh, in that sense, your question is very important, but it, it's also a little discouraging because um, Finding corrected infrared geometry is away from n equals infinity is a challenging and complicated problem. So, so uh, everybody seemed to be very self congratulatory, and in particular Hong, he used a really curious uh, expression about how we have made wonderful um, predictions, uh, still to be verified by uh, heavy ion colliders. It was uh, somehow implied that soon there might be confirmation. Confirmation was the word being used. I was wondering that when you have a theoretical prediction, is there not the option of actually falsifying the theory? That's how predictions work, yes? Yeah, yeah. So, how do you falsify? Well, actually, can I make a comment about this? I mean, a, a, a way in which this endeavor is not so satisfactory, um, and I would say in I some sense, that. no, and in some, <laughs> sense, in some sense can't be falsified, is, is that it's completely clear in most of the applications of holography to these systems that there is no controlled way to improve the models. With QCD at the LHC, if Lance Dixon works really hard and computes the nine loop amplitudes, you expect improved agreement. And if you don't get the improved agreement, there's a principal problem because you can bound the error. When comparing n equals four to the quark muon plasma, there is no a priori expectation with a small parameter that tells you how close you have to be to the correct behavior. So, so I think this endeavor has to be viewed as more a qualitative matching than something that, that, that can be improved in principle order by order and therefore that you can contradict. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Yeah, if there's some qualitative effect, then predictive. I agree, and in that view, I find it stunning to use the word prediction. Oh, it is a prediction because, the, uh, <laughs> because of the, say, if you found some effect. Confirmation? In the, in the first of the Yamil theory, and uh, that same effect was found in QCD, that's a stunning success. And if people didn't know from any other method, then that's a stunning success. Uh, maybe I should add something to what Tim is, is, is saying. It is true in one sense that when you say that if you measure this cost, you're going to find that much, it is a prediction. I think the interesting question is if you don't find it, what do you falsify? And I think the one obvious thing that one would say is that any performance is not approximation to whatever you're measuring for this particular problem. That's, of course, there are other possibilities. You may be falsified. Somebody else might may claim that you falsify something, something else. However, I should say that although what Shamit mentioned is true, that is most of the models that we're using are not controllable approximations to what we're supposed to measure, I think the most important impact, at least in this type of community that I've seen, uh, is mostly to provide toy models for mechanisms and how they can work strong coupling rather than concrete and detailed results, although people may think that A over S is something like this. And I think even that contribution is um, quite important. On the other hand, I think the field, if it wants to claim any kind of practical application, it has to go well beyond that, and I think most of us would, would agree with one more comment in this. According to what is happening right now at LHC, and if, in fact, the fluctuations I mentioned there, in fact, are precise kind of fluctuations, it what is measured, in fact, in the last year or so by Alice and the other experiments uh, in uh, heavy ion collisions, and this is a, a measurement that is much, much more accurate than what has been done at Crick. And it has two inputs. 
One is hydro, and in particular all the story that we're discussing about angel breasts and many other things that could contribute, and the other is initial conditions impact in the collisions. And I think if for some reason one of the uncertainties uh, is reduced, that would measure angel breasts impact with accuracy that's at least 10 times better than what it has been done until now, which is uh, with a, a, an accuracy of about 100%. So there is hope that one can get precise answers for some of these things, and then it's up to us to persuade them that we can predict the gold marks <laughs> numbers like this. So do you, do you think the re recent ex exchanges, I sort of got the feeling that there is a consensus that the holographic program should not give, uh, as an output, quantitative predictions, but, but rather qualitative behaviors? Is that what was being said? To have quantitative predictions, you need something can be improvable. You need something can be, yeah, as Xiaomi said, yeah, uh, it, you need something can be, uh, yeah, in order to be quantitative, you need a systematic uh, expansion and, uh, and something can be improvable. But it, we don't have it. So, 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 so even if sometimes quantitatively you find, may find the same uh, agreements like either or less, but we really don't know whether that's systematic or whether that's a, 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 because there's no systematic way you can compare the QCD and the incubus of young male theory, whether the number, two numbers are close, whether that's pure accident or purely determined by physics. Without such a, without a systematic way to improve your answer, there's no way to answer such a question. So this is indeed an intrinsic limitation of... Yeah, it is an intrinsic limitation. So, so, so at least in my own opinion, it's maybe easier to look for, it's certainly much easier to look for qualitative effect or a theoretical structure. And, uh, and then that kind of thing, uh, once discovered, will be forever there. And uh, uh, if, it's now, uh, if it's not now realized in the experiment, maybe 100 years later will be realized in the experiment. Say, suppose Xiaomi found some new faces using his non-mesotropic uh, uh, brains, Maybe it's not discovered now, maybe it will dis be discovered a hundred years later. So, so those kind of things, once you discover it, will not go away. So it's harder to find quantitative effects, but it's logically possible that there is some quantitative effect that is so universal that you could predict it accurately. Potentially, David's two-thirds power law could be an example. Um, then you have to understand, then you have to understand that two-thirds power law. Yes. And that's what's yes. wanting to solve the half of the model. Then it's a more difficult question. Uh, because before you're able to solve the half of the model, you don't know whether that number, whether uh, even half of the model belongs to that universality class. So just to summarize this discussion about all things being falsifiable or not, I think first, of course, it's, we should be slightly more modest, and I think this, this fact of uncovering universal behavior and structure is that's already a success because, I mean, after all, we're dealing with strongly coupled systems, and there's many people who are desperate for method. I mean, of course, there is no well-defined method for describing a strongly coupled system. So all we are trying to do is to find some new complementary approach to make any statement about not strongly coupled systems. And I think, well, at least partially, even condensed matter physicists are excited because they are desperate for new methods. And at least we, we offer them some, of course, very crude and very general, but nevertheless, uh, I would say, new insight. And I think that's, you know, that's already a success, which I think is nice, and it's nice to continue along this avenue. But of course, that's fine for a while, but let's say in a couple of years, I would agree with you, we should push this further and uh, find something more concrete. But nevertheless, I think, Universal statements are already quite a success, which shouldn't be forgotten. Coming back to uh, like improving your prediction, so is, is your idea like if we would have classified the landscape of uh, brains, could sort of uh, maybe have this tunable parameter to scan over the landscape of brains and find the right theory for the right model? Is that I'm, the philosophy? I'm a pessimist, so so. My idea is what we can actually do easily in ADS-CFT is classical gravity. That's our one tool. So the one thing that we can possibly do that, that doesn't require 
understanding remote remote backgrounds and strongly coupled string signal models is classifying all the phases and seeing what they are. And when you think about it, that's an amazing thing because these are highly quantum strongly interacting phases. So if you had told the condensed matter physicist ab initio in 1970, for an infinite class of quantum field theories, I'll be able to tell you exactly what the low energy phase structure is, they would be amazed. Now it so happens that this large and strongly coupled regime is precisely that which has nothing to do with electrons and, and lattices in any obvious sense. But it's what we can do and so I think we should do it and, and then you know, what comes out may or may not be realized eventually using quantum simulation or in some real material, but it's, it's all we can do, so we should just do it. Sure. Maybe I could add something to, to what Sharif is saying. Let me make an analogy again, going back to quantum free theory. Uh, in quantum free theory, of course, we have a way of eventually getting to the formalism of quantum free theory. And then you can ask the question, you have a system and you want to see if it's described by theory. Now, the quantum field theories usually were using, in most cases, are weakly coupled quantum field theories, and then the answer whether you can find a theory that eventually matches a problem is not such a difficult problem. And the reason is, from the formulation of the quantum field theory itself to eventually what you measure, uh, there's a small distance between these two, and then you can make this analogy once you understand quantum field theory. I think string theory landscape in the way that it was posed is more or less something similar. There's a big difference, though, and the big difference is that what goes in, in fact, into defining what are the different parts of this landscape to what eventually you measure is a little bit more complicated. And therefore, when you're looking for a specific theory or part of the landscape that fits something you measure, this is a much harder problem. Even if you write uh, an effective theory, because in quantum field theory, most of the time, and in fact, these days, we believe that most of the theories we're using are effective theories once you go up in energy. If you're using an analog of an effective theory where you have a few low line fields, your gravity, etc., and you're trying to do uh, uh, your job, um, the eventual question that some, and suppose you find some gravitational system, let's say bottom up, that more or less describes experimental data in a given problem. Have you finished? Well, definitely you have made an important uh, step because you present a model where at least for a set of observables you're getting answers, they agree with the experiment, they can make even predictions. I think it's one step. But in condensed matter I think there is a even if you achieve that there may be a second step. How do you understand this in terms of conventional way of that we uh, condensed matter physicists are trying to understand this in terms of electrons, of, uh, photons, etc. As far as I'm concerned, if one makes the first step is already a major achievement and you can even live without the second step, but I think eventually the second step may be necessary. And I think it's a good idea to order the levels at which you can claim victory. Yeah. This, this is what um, people are <coughs> thinking here of using classical properties and other ones. And if there's something universal about this is that you have a, the real field theory should be a large N gauge theory, non abelian one. For condensed matter systems, these are, uh, there are some non-abelian gauge uh, theories in uh, condensed uh, matter systems, but that's uh, something that's not universal. And that, I don't know to what extent this is something that's going to be always plaguing the holographic approach to these uh, systems. And that's something I, it's, that's universal. If you are, if you are asking whether the generic condensed matter system will be described by such a theory, I think the answer is no. Yeah. The question is, are there any preferably uh, interesting such systems that may have such an effective description and people suspect that there might be? Well, I think another, another point is, just in the condensed matter literature, there is this fine tradition of, of doing vector-like large n, yeah. uh, which they certainly have used to great, great effect. And uh, there are reasons to think that matrix-like large n in some ways preserves more more interesting strong coupling dynamics than vector-like large n. Yeah. So, so in that sense, if they've been happy with, with the vector-like models, they should at least be interested in what the adjoint models give. Uh, I agree, it has nothing to do with electrons in a lattice a priori. Yeah, even though, so even though, uh, 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 yeah, even if the, the, the amount of people are not interested, say, in the matrix or not yet, still, there's always, so what's the remarkable thing about the matter system? that at the microscopic level, at long distance, the physics often are independent of short distance structure. So maybe uh, uh, if one finds some kind of dynamical effect, 
next block. One more general philosophy comment, um, since we're not allowed to talk about firewalls. Um, <laughs> there, there, there's a fine tradition in our field of studying field theories for their own sake, which have nothing to do with nature. And by this I mean the n equals 2 and n equals 4 field theories and the M5 grade theory. And one of the you know beautiful phenomena like cyber duality and cascades and so forth in field theory were discovered in that context. And some people try to apply them to models. But I think nobody questions that that's a rich and interesting endeavor just to learn about behaviors in field theory. And so I think, you know, at the very worst, um, there are a lot of questions here about applying ADS to, to condensed matter physics. Nobody ever looks at a talk about uh, Gaiata duality and equals two supersymmetry and says, how do you apply that to the Ising model? So I, I think what should really do this is just another way of, of studying the behaviors of field theory. And to pretend that the real motivation is just to apply it to the condensed matter system is probably, I, I, that's a marketing tool maybe, but I don't think that's really the right way to think about it. That's what you're writing your book <laughs> I think another very interesting challenge to relate to ADCMT is to, uh, to understand non relativistic field theories in, in context of string theory. So, things that are no longer ADS, but to do holography for space times that, uh, you know, are memorial shifts type, things like that. I think that's definitely a very interesting. is that if you want to have to develop turbulence, you have to be in a space which is finite. And solving gravity in a space which is finite is difficult. And in fact, I presume that's the challenge if we, if gravitational physics is supposed to say something about turbulence. Yeah, unless you have Prochaska. Unless you have, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Gravity techniques will teach us about uh, hydrodynamics. It's true that gravity contains more than hydrodynamics, but eventually we're going to go to solve problems, or it will be the other way. Thank <laughs> you. 
your system that runs the most <laughs> <laughs> standard techniques that would complement other techniques that we have for doing physics in, let's say, 20 years from now. But this is a fast. It's still interesting because, uh, <laughs> in fact, it would, it would, have it would say more if we may not answer what you know. But still. <laughs> it would be kind of strange to attend the holographic wave map for computer to be. <laughs> <laughs> Even what's my equation? 
Education is not in the undergraduate. <laughs> <laughs>